So you may feel like you're a little late to the YouTube game. You might even be wondering if it's too late to start a YouTube channel in 2024. But I am here to tell you, it's not. Now is honestly the best time to start a YouTube channel. Not only do you have more resources available to you than ever before, but there's also more people looking to watch YouTube content than ever before. YouTube is honestly like the new TV. And trust me, there is an audience out there that is gonna wanna watch what you have to share. You just need to know how to find them. And I am gonna tell you how. Today I'm gonna share the essentials that you need to be successful with YouTube 2024 we're going over the gear the software the strategies so let's get into it you can't make a video about youtube for beginners without talking about cameras and i'm super excited to share my new vlogging setup with you i honestly think it's perfect for beginners but it's also been perfect for me like i think a lot of times people think of beginner gear as a sacrifice in quality but in this case it's not okay so here are the essential pieces okay it's my phone this tripod and these lav mics and as a bonus a battery bank for my phone. This has become kind of an important part of my gear because my phone dies really quickly when I'm filming on it all the time. So if that's the case for you too, you wanna grab a battery bank. And speaking of that, I want you to know you don't need the newest iPhone to do this. That's why mine's dying all the time. I have an iPhone 12. So I know newer ones might have slightly longer battery life, but honestly, the footage looks the same. Like the video is still in 4K, it looks crisp, it looks great. Unless you're really wanting to go next level and shoot in the new like Apple ProRes log format that they have on the 15s, like you don't need the newest phone, just film on what you have. Now, you may or may not have noticed I am not filming on my phone right now. It's right here. <laughs> so obviously I do have other gear, which we're gonna get into in a second, but I wanna prove to you right now just how good iPhone footage can look. As you can see, with just some natural lighting, a lav mic and using the back facing camera on my phone, I can get honestly like professional quality results. If you already have an iPhone, you pretty much have what you need to start vlogging. And I love this tripod because it starts at the size of like a selfie stick and then you can really quickly extend it to make it a lightweight and portable tripod. Okay, but seriously, I need to show you just how easy it is to set this thing up. So it's like selfie stick size. It just folds out like this and then you can extend it. This is part of why I love using a phone to vlog specifically because the gear that you can use with your phone is so lightweight and easy to use. Obviously a bigger camera is gonna need a bulkier tripod. Also, the setup is so low key and discreet. So if you wanna go out and film vlogs out in the world, you're gonna feel a lot less awkward just filming on your phone than you are with like a massive camera with a big lens and a big fuzzy microphone on top. And I feel like that's a consideration that you don't wanna overlook. By the way, all the links to all this stuff is in my free content creator gear guide. So I'll link that in the description. Okay, like I was saying before, I don't film all of my videos this way. I do have gear other than my phone. And when I'm not filming on my phone, I like to use my Sony ZV E10 or my Sony ZV1. I love using the E10 because of the interchangeable lenses. I'm always shooting with my Sigma 16 millimeter lens because I get like a nice depth of field where the background's a little bit blurry, but it's still quite nice and wide, which is important when you film in a small space like I do. Now, the ZV-1 on the other hand, also amazing. It's great because if you do want a camera that's not just your phone, you buy this and you have everything in one package, like the lens is built in, still has the flip around screen so you can see yourself when you're filming. And it's also very lightweight and portable from a vlogging perspective. Now, with either of these cameras, I'm always gonna be using my Rode Video Micro. This is the perfect little external microphone because it doesn't need any batteries and it has never done me dirty. For some reason, audio can be just a little bit finicky for me and I've tried different microphones and sometimes even though it's like a nice expensive microphone, it just doesn't sound right. But the Rode Video Micro always sounds nice. Now, the reason that I use my camera for my main YouTube shoots is just simply because of the workflow. It's not necessarily because the footage looks that much better, like iPhone footage looks really great. But when I have really long 4K clips, it's easier to just transfer it via my SD card rather than trying to airdrop it, which is what I normally do from footage from my phone. And of course, for me, I'm often showing my phone when I'm making YouTube videos or showing something on my phone. So obviously, I would need a separate camera to film that. Honestly, I think all these three setups, the version with the phone, the version with the ZV-1, and the version with the ZV-E10 are all really great setups for YouTube. And while these definitely vary in price, the ZV-E10 being the most expensive, I actually think all of these are in what I would call like the affordable range compared to what you see a lot of YouTubers shooting with. 
as soon as you get into the full frame range of cameras, so we're talking stuff like the Sony a7C, et cetera, the lenses get really expensive, as obviously do the camera bodies. So if you do wanna go for an interchangeable lens camera, but you wanna keep it more on the affordable side, I definitely recommend the ZV-E10. But overall, start with your phone. You can do a lot with your phone, and I recommend just upgrading when you start to run into limitations with filming on your phone. Okay, so we've gone over the hardware. Now let's talk about the software, the applications that you're gonna to wanna to use to make your videos. Okay, so the editing app you use is gonna be a very personal choice. Honestly, we can all argue about which one is the best, but I really think the best one for you is the one that you're used to, that you know well, and that you're efficient with. I've been editing with Premiere Pro for like over 10 years, so I'm very fast with it, and that's what I tend to use. If you're interested in getting into the Adobe ecosystem, you could start out with Adobe's beginner editing app, Rush. You can get it on your phone and on your laptop, so you can work on your projects in both places which is kind of cool and it's a great like beginner orientation to Premiere Pro. If you have a Mac and you eventually want to learn Final Cut, iMovie can be a good place to start for free and no matter what type of computer you have you can start editing for free with DaVinci Resolve. I've just recently started experimenting a little bit with Resolve and I'm really liking it so far and the free version really has all of the features that you need to do a basic edit. If you want to start doing stuff like generating automatic captions or doing more animations and stuff then you will need to upgrade to the paid version, but it's just like a one-time fee of like about $300, I think. So all of these are really solid options that kind of have like a free or cheap entry level you can begin with and then eventually upgrade once you wanna do more complex edits. Now, no matter what editing software you end up going with, you're gonna to wanna to make templates for yourself. This is the biggest hack to edit great videos Quickly. So I personally have a Premiere Pro project file template and inside that template I have a sequence of my go-to title cards, transitions, and I have templates for my favorite fonts all saved in there so that when I go to edit a new video I can really easily copy and paste my title card over from that template sequence onto my actual video and I don't have to spend all this time recreating my titles. It also means you're gonna have that built-in brand consistency because you're using the same fonts, the same effects all the time. I also have a B-roll library built into this template as well. So on my computer, I have a folder full of B-roll that I've shot over the past three or four years that I've just built up over time and I even have it categorized into separate areas. So I have one that's like clips of me filming videos, clips of me creating Instagram content. I have a lifestyle category, that sort of thing. And then I've imported that entire folder into this Premiere Pro project template. And most importantly, I took the time to go through these clips and change the file name over to words describing what the clip is so it's searchable. So not only are my clips categorized into folders, I can also just go right into Premiere Pro and start searching like writing in a notebook or doing yoga, and I can find the clips that I filmed of myself doing those things. Now, at the beginning of your journey, you might not have filmed a ton of B-roll of yourself, and that's okay. You can still have really, really dynamic visuals included in your YouTube videos, and all you need is a subscription to Storyblocks, the sponsor of today's video. I myself have been a paying customer of Storyblocks for many years, since my days as a freelance videographer, all through my YouTube career, I've loved using Storyblocks to get the footage that I need to make my videos really engaging. If you haven't heard of them before, Storyblocks is a stock media library where with one subscription, you get unlimited downloads of stock footage, animation templates, background music, sound effects, basically anything you need to make your videos more visually dynamic. I'm grabbing stuff from Storyblocks all the time, whether it's the background textures from my title cards or some beautiful drone footage of a beach in Portugal. Basically, whatever you're looking for, you'll be able to find it on Storyblocks. Plus, Storyblocks is continually updating their catalog based on customer demand, so you're always getting new, fresh clips on there that you can use in your videos. You're legally allowed to use everything that you download from Storyblocks in your YouTube videos so you don't have to worry about any copyright claims. And like I said, it's one set subscription price for unlimited downloads so you can get everything that you need for your video without worrying about going over budget. To get all of the visuals that you need to make your videos awesome, you can sign up for Storyblocks using the link in the description or go to storyblocks.com Katie to check it out. I promise it's gonna be a game changer. 
By the way, if all of this editing stuff is feeling a little bit overwhelming to you and you'd kind of like some help with it, I wanted to let you know that my agency Creatorly Media is currently accepting new YouTube editing clients. So if you want more details about that, or if you want to apply to work with us, you can check out the link in the description. Okay, now that you're set up to actually film and edit your videos, let's talk about the strategic approaches you're gonna to wanna to use to actually grow an audience on YouTube in 2024. If you've watched some of my recent videos about YouTube growth, then you'll probably be familiar with the help hub and hero method that I've been talking a lot about lately, but I wanna simplify this strategy down even further. Essentially, when you're making videos for your YouTube channel, you have two options. Create videos for your existing audience to nurture that community, or create videos that are going to reach a new audience and help you grow. And especially at the beginning, you're gonna to wanna to focus on creating content that's gonna help you grow. Now, how do you practically grow a YouTube channel? Well, you have to get your videos in front of people who don't know you yet. So they can watch your video, get to know you, and then hit subscribe. On YouTube, there are really two main ways to get your videos in front of people who don't know you yet. There's YouTube search and there's the YouTube homepage. First, let's talk about YouTube search. It's the more straightforward of the two options. Essentially, to reach a new audience through YouTube search, you need to make videos that people are searching for. And then use your SEO skills to ensure that your video is actually going to show up when someone is searching for it. And it's also important that you have an intriguing thumbnail that draws them in once they see your video in search results. So for this type of video, we're often going to be creating something that's educational, maybe a tutorial, maybe tips or advice. Really anything that you could throw how to in front of is going to be a great candidate for a search video. To come up with these ideas, you really just want to think about who your target audience is and what their problems or their struggles are and the kind of words they would personally use to search for that. Sometimes when you're actually an advanced expert in a topic, it can make it more difficult because you kind of forget how beginners speak about these things. But if you use your like expert terminology in your title or in your description, that might not be the kind of thing that a beginner is actually searching for. So keep that in mind when you're crafting these videos. For example, if I wanted to make a photography tutorial teaching beginners how to get shallow depth of field in their photos, rather than titling the video how to get shallow depth of field in your photos, I'd be better off titling it how to get a blurry background in your photos because that's more likely to be the actual words that a beginner who's searching for this would use. So obviously that's gonna be different in every specific niche, but just keep that in mind when you're titling your videos. So that's the search side of things. That's fairly straightforward. You can imagine someone searching for something on YouTube, your video pops up in search, and then they start watching your channel. That is a really good, organic, slow and steady way to start building up an audience, but the homepage, if you do it right, can be a lot faster. So here's what you need to know about the YouTube homepage. The homepage is different and individual for every user and it's based on their past behavior and what they tend to engage with on the platform. For example, I personally love to watch a lot of van life content. So my YouTube homepage tends to have a lot of van life videos on it. Also videos that show up on the homepage are videos that the algorithm has kind of proven are engaging because at the end of the day, YouTube's goal is to keep their users on the platform longer. So they want to present us with the most engaging videos that are gonna keep us watching for as long as possible. So for that reason, the YouTube homepage is more likely to show videos that have a long view duration and also a high click-through rate. Okay, well, I know those are some new technical terms if you haven't heard of these before. Click-through rate is just the percentage of people who, when seeing your thumbnail, actually clicked on your video to go ahead and watch it. You'll notice if you go into YouTube Studio that each of your videos is gonna have a number of impressions that it has and then a number of actual views. Your impressions is gonna be way higher. That's the number of times that YouTube showed your thumbnail to a potential viewer. And then views is the actual number of times that somebody then clicked on that thumbnail and watched your video. So click-through rate is just a percentage that represents how many people that saw your thumbnail actually decided it was worth clicking on. Okay, view duration is basically how long the average viewer is watching your video for. Obviously, we all click on YouTube videos and we don't always watch them to the very end. Maybe we only watch it half of the way through. Maybe we only watch it for like 10% of the total video. Average view duration kind of represents that experience 
as a whole, like the entire audience, how long did they tend to watch your video for? Therefore, when it comes to getting your video on the homepage, it's all about making sure that you have a high click-through rate and a long view duration. And then when you've kind of proven to the algorithm that your video is worth clicking on and that people will watch it for a decent while, then YouTube will start surfacing your video on the home pages of people who have shown interest in similar content in the past. So that's really what it comes down to. No matter your niche or the demographics of your audience, it's really about creating thumbnails and titles that are going to yield a high click through rate and editing your videos to be fast paced and engaging and including value up until the very end so that people watch them for as long as possible. So especially at the beginning, I'm going to encourage you to focus on creating more of those videos that are about reaching a new audience and a balance of some for search and some for the homepage is a good way to do this. As you start growing your audience, you're also going to want to include videos that you just find creatively fulfilling and that you know your most engaged audience members are gonna appreciate. So we're talking vlogs, we're talking day in the life, stuff that's a little bit more personal. That kind of stuff is going to tend to perform not as great because people who don't know who you are yet aren't gonna be that interested in clicking on your vlog. But if you want to eventually vlog in the long term, you wanna start including that in your strategy early on to get your audience used to that because otherwise it's gonna be really difficult if you build up a large audience and then all of a sudden pivot to a different format of content, you're not gonna find that to be very successful. Successful. So from the beginning, you might want to consider doing an every other week approach where on week one, you make a video that is for reaching new people. And on week two, you make a video that's for serving your existing audience. And then you can also alternate for that video reaching new people, whether it's going to be for search or for the homepage. Now, one final strategy note that I want to make that a lot of people are not talking about, but I think it's something that a lot of creators run into. And that's that you want to be careful of not editing yourself completely out of the video. What I mean by that is as we all feel pressured to make our videos as fast paced as possible to make them super engaging to make people watch to the very end we tend to cut out every pause every breath every little mistake or like kind of quirky or funny parts of our videos because we're like we just need to edit this so tight we need it just to be as engaging as possible and that is really important but i think it's a balance because if you want to build a community that's actually invested in you and feels connected to you, then you don't wanna just be this like algorithm robot that is just delivering content as fast as possible. Because while people might watch your video to the very end, like it might be good for view duration, they might not have any motivation to come back to another video from you specifically. They might just move on to the next video that's also super engaging and, and fast paced. So I do think this is a difficult creative challenge. I'll be honest about that. It's hard to figure out what parts of your personality, what parts that aren't super relevant to the plot of your video can you include so that people can get to know you while you keep the video interesting because the last thing you want to do is spend like the first five minutes of the video doing a whole intro about you and how your day is going and blah 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 people are not going to keep watching your video but i tend to think that if you start to include a little bit of personality a little bit of lifestyle here and there especially later on in your video when you have people that are kind of there because they're already invested in what you're doing, you might see better results from that. It's all about experimenting and figuring out what the right balance is for you. But what I do know is you don't want to completely make your videos devoid of your personality for the sake of making them as fast as possible, because you're going to end up growing an audience that doesn't even really like know you that well. And the true power in being a successful YouTuber is having a community that is connected with you and that trusts you and that you have a relationship with. So you wanna make sure that you don't over optimize your videos to the point where you lose that. So my friends, as simple and boiled down as it all might sound, that really is the key to being successful on YouTube in 2024, crafting videos that reach new audiences, nurturing your existing audience, and making sure that you include your personality and your own unique take on things in your videos so that you can build a community that's actually connected with you. Now, if you are specifically interested in doing this through vlogging, I have the perfect video for you to check out next because I made an entire guide on how to edit your vlog so that you can keep your viewer engaged to the very end especially if you struggle with having filmed a whole bunch of random stuff and then trying to figure out how to put that together into a cohesive video. That's exactly what I tackle in this one right here. So make sure you check that out next. As always, thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having adventures and following your dreams and I can't wait to see you succeed on YouTube in 2024. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.